Uh, my name is Andrew Lyson. I am an assistant professor of media study at the University at Buffalo, the State University of New York. I'm currently working on a book uh, entitled New Media at the End of History that looks at the arrival of digital multimedia in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Now, multimedia had existed in various ways before that, uh, but this is the moment when it sort of all came together. And uh, scholars other than myself have already kind of pointed that out, but nobody's really looked at that specific moment and the transformation uh, that took place in sort of culture at that time. Um, and so what I'm interested in is sort of syncing that up with geopolitical developments, uh, specifically the fall of the Berlin Wall and the collapse of state socialism, um, and the way that digital media seems to take over for that earlier sense of history and political struggle that uh, was a result of basically political economic struggles. Um, with the collapse of state socialism, that seems to be replaced by a kind of technological determinism in a sense that is so broad that we almost don't even notice it. Um, and multimedia is a factor in that. It's essentially the moment when the computer becomes able to absorb all other kinds of media and therefore large swathes of culture. And I think you know, we see the way that's played out over the last you know, 30 years since then. Uh, but this moment when it happened was actually incredibly dynamic and very interesting uh, and has been underexplored, I think. So my project kind of attempts to look at both the good and the bad things that happened as a result of that shift uh, to think about where we can go now that we're sort of completely saturated in that moment. Um, do you know where the term multimedia came from? So, I mean, my understanding is, is that it, it was a big uh, movement in the 60s, essentially, that came out of similar terms like intermedia that Dick Higgins uh, and other sort of artists of that time experimented with. But in the 60s, it mainly referred to uh, multiple kinds of analog media in conjunction with each other. Uh, people often cite things like hippie happenings or kind of, you know, rock concerts where there are sort of, uh, you know, light effects or other kinds of like putting jellied slides with like oils in them over a projector so that you get kind of funny effects while a band plays or something like that. Um, so in terms of digital multimedia, I don't know exactly where the first usage of, of it is. Um, Jimmy Marr, a very interesting guy, has written a book on the Amiga that makes the argument that the uh, Commodore Amiga was the very first multimedia computer, and that uh, you know came out in 1984. Um, but even he, in his book, says that it was around 1989 that it sort of the Amiga kind of fell off of its you know pedestal in a way and became replaced by a kind of broader concept of multimedia in um, the Macintosh and the IBM PC. Uh, and I think it's pretty clear for anybody who was around then, as I was, that the Macintosh is really the kind of key driver of that at that time. And so um, talk a little bit about what we're looking at today. So we're gonna be looking at some very interesting early artifacts. Apple had a, a group called the Apple Multimedia Lab that as I understand it was based in the city of San Francisco, rather unusually for Apple, I think, um, that developed these uh, sort of hybrid technologies or hybrid media formats um, based on both a CD-ROM and a Laserdisc. And what's really interesting about that is this predates a lot of sort of the Apple uh, multimedia that we know, such as QuickTime, uh, and doesn't really, so the computer did not really allow very easily for you to show uh, full motion video and things like that on it. Uh, although there were some interesting attempts, and I, I hope we'll get into those uh, in a minute. But so what they did is they would connect uh, a Macintosh computer with a Laserdisc player and use a HyperCard stack. HyperCard is um, sort of, I guess now, you know, perhaps forgotten, um, programming language slash hypermedia tool that allowed um, basically users without a lot of programming experience to create what they called stacks, which are essentially interlinked um, collections of individual cards, kind of like web pages, essentially, that you could then create just, a, they would be locally stored on a computer. You would create links between them and therefore be able to create a kind of dynamic um, experience by clicking through to different ones, uh, a nonlinear and dynamic experience. Uh, so what the, the Laserdisc allowed them to do was to add kind of full motion television quality video and sound to that experience. But um, I think as we'll see, it's also very interesting for the way that it shows that multimedia was a concept, but it wasn't a fully formed concept. The user interfaces are very clunky, and uh, just, just I mean, even without getting into the user interfaces, you can see you need kind of two screens and two big hulking, hulking machines in order to get the full experience of it, right? It wasn't the integrated kind of multimedia that we understand today when we sort of embed a YouTube link in a tweet or something like that. So how does this exact um, moment in time, this technology situated in this moment in time, 
how, what, how is that interesting in the context of your larger projects? So, I mean, I think there are two uh, things that stand out to me. One is, as I was kind of just getting at, um, it's a moment before everything was fully settled. Uh, and you can see that both in the form and in the content of these, um, th these tools. So, for example, in the Visual Almanac, it includes a lot of information about uh, the USSR. Uh, and the Visual Almanac seems to have been produced in, uh, in around late 1989, early 1990s. So ba essentially, by the time it got into the hands of people, and it was not necessarily a commercial product, I think it was something that was uh, distributed to educational facilities and things like that, um, you know, it was kind of out of date in a weird sort of way, uh, because it was showing you life in the Soviet Union as uh, it didn't exist or maybe only sort of existed for another you know, year in time. The Soviet Union collapsed in uh, 1991, but, um, but the Berlin Wall had already come down basically by the time this, this reached the hands of the people who would use it. So we were in this weird interregnum where nobody really understood the historical situation. Uh, so you see that in the content, you see that in the form where nobody really understood the historical situation of multimedia. They were trying to make something work that they hadn't quite figured out. Um, so that's, that's kind of one aspect that I think is interesting. And then the other aspect that I think is interesting is that it, as becomes clear if you look at especially the documentation that surrounds something like the Visual Almanac, which is I think the first and the main um, object we'll be looking at, they're, they're very interested in media history actually in a way that um, you know, perhaps we don't think about today. So there's all sorts of stuff in there about the history of photography, the history of cin cinema, and the history of time manipulation through media, which is a, which is a key point, right? Um, because these laser disc uh, hypercard stacks are kind of predicated on the notion of using the laser disc as a kind of asynchronous seek mechanism, which by which I mean basically you can do something a lot like a hypercard stack with it, where you can move from segment to segment in a nonlinear fashion, right? So this is a moment when they start to use the tools of kind of analog media, and LaserDisc itself is a very interesting format because it's kind of a hybrid analog digital format. Um, the actual pictures are encoded in analog nature, but the, the frames are individually kind of segmented as they are on a film strip or something like that. But because there is this kind of um, computerized seek mechanism, you're able to kind of move between frames in such a way that you can create a nonlinear experience out of what is essentially a linear media. I mean, you could uh, just plug, pop one of these in and hit play. It would actually be a very surreal experience because the way that they created these disks was uh, with this nonlinear uh, experience in mind. And so the disks are actually crammed with information. You know, uh, a lot of times, the hypercard stack basically creates or uh, directs users to still frames. So if you watch it as a laser disc, the way you might watch a laser disc movie or something, you would see a, a rush of information fly by. Uh, similarly, we discovered that there are multiple audio channels in use for different purposes at once, right? So um, if you were to try to listen to the soundtrack while you're watching the videos, they might not sync up, they might not relate to each other. Uh, so it would be a very uh, schizophrenic experience in some ways to try to watch this as one would watch a regular movie. Uh, nevertheless, the format is kind of conducive to watching regular movies, and it's with this added kind of communication between the computer and the LaserDisc player that you get the ability to create um, and experience these nonlinear formats. The hardware setup is essentially you needed a Macintosh computer, which I think could be anything from an SE30 onwards. So uh, SE30s were the kind of old uh, single unit, um, you know, monitor in the unit, black and white. Actually, I think you could go back systems. to the Mac Plus. You could go back all yeah, the way to a Mac Plus. Yeah, it says the manual. Go okay, back to Mac Plus. so you could use a variety of um, Macintosh systems, going back to some of the earliest ones, in order to to use this. But the Macintosh 2 was kind of uh, the big multimedia push for for Apple, essentially. Uh, the Macintosh 2 was the first computer that. They, uh, that could do full color, that could do multiple monitors, and uh, as one of the other laser discs we'll look at shows, was the first one where they tried to basically create fully rendered uh, computer animation on. So they were really trying to sell this as a kind of multimedia tool. Um, and the way it would work would be you would have uh, the hypercard stack running on a Macintosh computer, and then you would connect it with a serial cable to the laser disc player. Um, and the serial cable basically allows the computer to tell the LaserDisc player what frame to jump to and potentially how long to play a clip for, when to stop, that kind of thing. So very interestingly, the, um, the CD-ROM that the software came on that you put into the computer 
doesn't really contain a lot of uh, what we would consider to be multimedia in the sense of uh, digitized audio and video, for instance. It, the HyperCard stack itself is rather small, but it contains a lot of other things, other things that might be interested to people, interesting to people who are on uh, using that system, uh, various demonstrations of other software products and things like that. Um, but again, the CD-ROM is not really the mechanism for the uh, audiovisual content, if you will. It's a mechanism for the code, essentially, and you know the HyperCard stack to the extent that it is a kind of audiovisual thing. But if you want to see full motion video, if you want to hear sound, most of the time you're going to the, the LaserDisc player and the computer is telling the LaserDisc player uh, what to play. Um, that setup makes it very hard to emulate because essentially you're dealing with uh, a couple things. You're dealing with a, an essentially analog technology in many ways. So you can't just rip a laser disc as easily as you can rip a, a CD. There's no kind of iTunes for laser discs. Um, and kind of tying on to that, laser discs were just never as popular a format as the compact disc or, or anything else. We kind of jumped, uh, you know, mainstream technology jumped from the VHS tape to the DVD, kind of skipping. Um, the laser disc, and even skipping to a certain extent the CD-ROM, right? I mean, CD-ROM has postage stamp videos, usually not you know full-size television. So this is kind of a bit of a detour in a, you know in a more kind of um, teleological history of media development that raises interesting questions for you know media scholars, media archaeologists, and people who who want to look at it. So we have to do this setup in order to basically understand the content and in order to understand what they were trying to do at the time. Uh, so we're looking at a Macintosh 2CI here, which is actually perfect for my uh, interests because it was released in uh, late 1989, so it's, it's period appropriate. It's a sort of later and more uh, sophisticated version of the Macintosh 2, which was the first Macintosh to do color, the first Macintosh to do uh, multiple monitors, and generally the source of Apple's big multimedia push. Um, again, we're running sort of period appropriate operating system software here, so system 6.0.7. Um, maybe a little later, but in the same time frame. And we've got, normally when you would run this, you would run it off of the CD-ROM, which you can see over here is, is sort of an external device to the, to the actual computer chassis itself. Um, instead, we've put all the information on an external hard drive just to make it a little easier. Um, but here's the HyperCard stack that represents the uh, Visual Almanac. And so if we click on the home stack for the Visual Almanac, it should run the HyperCard stack. At this point, it's going to ask us to choose the video disc player. Uh, here we have the video disc player, laser disc player hooked up to um, a television. The, we're using, again, a slightly more advanced version of the laser disc player than the ones that are um, offered on this list, but this is essentially a uh, derivative of the Pioneer 4200. Um, they're already connected via the serial cable, so once we choose this and click OK, you can see the laser disc player spin up a little bit, and we get um, the different, you know, the, the same kind of information on the television as we do on the computer monitor. And you can see here the difference as well between uh, sort of what HyperCard was capable of uh, in its sort of native configuration and what uh, the LaserDisc player is. Uh, we have an interesting HyperCard stack that is actually a, a year or so earlier than this um, that uses, we think, special software to draw color on top of the HyperCard um, the native HyperCard information itself, which is in black and white. Um, but this gives you a good example of basically what most people would have seen when they used their computers versus when they looked at um, a, a LaserDisc. So you can see the kind of the gap between, say, televisual content and uh, computerized content that existed even in kind of these more advanced systems at this time. Um, so if we click anywhere to begin, we go through here and we have. Um, we have a bunch of different sort of options to choose from. And this is basically, uh, it's a very nice HyperCard stack, but this is basically what HyperCard is, is that you, know, you click on these different things, it opens up different cards, and allows you uh, to move differently throughout this kind of program. Um, so if we click on the orientation here, uh, we see the screen change on the LaserDisc, uh, but we also get kind of information about uh, the Visual Almanac itself. Uh, I think it's worth noting that 
they have actually explicit instructions on how to navigate. Uh, by now, I think we've kind of internalized certain modes of navigation on the web, especially. Um, but these are all kind of relatively new concepts at this time and require, uh, both, they both require a bit of instruction. And also, as I think we'll see, they're not fully uh, formed in the way that we have them now. So there's a lot of kind of um, things that need explanation and a lot of things that may not seem, seem to make sense to modern day uh, computer users. Um, so this offers a bunch of different ways to understand how to navigate through all of these systems. As well as if we go back to the, uh, the orientation screen, we can get an introduction that kind of explains to us what the Visual Almanac is about. And that will play on the uh, LaserDisc player. The Visual Almanac is a resource of images and sounds. This is Walter Cronkite. Use your Macintosh computer to see things from other points of view. At different times, in different places, in a new light. Then create your own presentations and bring the world into your classroom. So what we've just seen is not that dissimilar to what you would see if you were to create your own um, navigation through the system or to just use some of the tools that they have built into it. I think that is actually just one contiguous clip. Uh, so it was pre um, designed and pre kind of edited and put on there in that contiguous form, but it contains a lot of clips that exist in sort of isolated form on the LaserDisc and various other sections. So that sort of introduction is actually a very good uh, sense of what you would get from, from using the whole software. And in fact, the whole kind of conception of multimedia at this time seems to be about putting together different slices of uh, pre-recorded audio and video, essentially. Let's look at the activities because those are the more ready-made yeah. kind of stuff. And then we can just go into some of the collections and just show people what's there. So yeah, here in the activities, they give you a bunch of sort of pre-designed things that you can do uh, with, with the LaserDisc and with the software to show you kind of what it's capable of. Um, as I said before, this is kind of in designed to the educational market. And so it's designed to give teachers and students an idea of what they might be able to do when they go in and build their own collections, which is something that the uh, HyperCard stack allows them to do as well. Um, so as I mentioned before, one of the things that's very interesting to me at this point is this kind of the notion of time that's sort of expressed in really the whole, the whole thing, not just a notion of history, which is also expressed, but a notion of time and temporality, right? Because what's at play here is precisely the ability to manipulate temporality. Um, the way that you can pull different clips from different segments of the laser disc is sort of, you know, the sort of the most kind of low level um, media specific, if you might say, uh, notion of that. But it, it plays out in kind of the activities that they give as well, such as these notions of uh, durations. Um, so these contain some very interesting exercises that basically show you how you can use this multimedia software to play things backwards, play things at different speeds, and generally understand time in a different way. Uh, so as you can see, control time, speed it up, slow it down, reverse it. Time is in your hands. So we have a lot of different kinds of uh, examples here. Let's just click on one, let's say the weather. So this allows you to visualize the weather over the course of uh, the year of 1986. Um, so if you just press play, So that's interesting, but what you can see I think is more interesting is that you're, you can control the speed at which this plays. So for example, if you wanted to 
speed it up, you could get 10 seconds instead of you know one and a half for each for each day, or 10 days will pass for each second instead of uh, one and a half days. Excuse me. Um, so if we play this, you can see it goes much faster, um, but it also can go much slower. So you can get down to literally a frame by frame rendering of the sequence to see um, just how subtly weather will change or anything will, that can be recorded in uh, film, essentially film or video uh, at this speed. You can also play it backwards. That's just one frame at a time. Yeah. You need to press the other button. Oh, sorry. So you can also play it backwards to see the same thing at the same number of speeds. So we can speed this up. And it actually dynamically changes, as you can see. So what's interesting is, is this is kind of video manipulation that I guess, especially today, we might view as almost like a parlor trick or something like that. Um, but it has a long history in the sort of history of the moving image, where this actually is you know, one of the sort of key interventions that moving, media, moving image media make into our understanding of time and our understanding of history, going back as the sort of uh, visual almanac itself describes to kind of um, you know, studies of animal motion and things that are sort of at the root of the history of photography itself. I think it might be good to uh, switch to the B side for this, because sure. I think those um, yeah. examples Did you are wanna, more interesting. I mean, you, one thing that you didn't show was that y you could actually jump to a specific point in the movie in that. Okay, yeah. So you can actually click right. into the, in the thing. So in addition to moving in this kind of, um, in this more kind of uh, VCR or cassette tape like control structure, uh, we also have the timeline, which is something that um, is quite interesting in the history of multimedia itself. Um, but here we're able to scrub throughout the entire uh, clip to basically pick a moment that you can um, jump to. So this again allows a kind of uh, a nonlinear way of experiencing all of this content. If you wanna see, for example, I would imagine that the first day of the year and the last day of the year look relatively similar, although not in terms of cloud cover, apparently. Um, but you know, I mean, they're only kind of one day apart in the, uh, in the, in the seasons. So one could get these kind of comparisons by jumping back and forth. Uh, similarly, one could see what it's like at the exact opposite seasonal moment by clicking somewhere in the middle to understand um, you know, how weather changes over the year, essentially. So on the second side of the laser disc, uh, there are other kind of examples of the same thing. Uh, just to show you a few of them, uh, the circus tent is one of the clips that you saw when we ran the uh, the introduction video, um, and here you can see it as a kind of individual clip that's used to demonstrate uh, the multimedia capabilities of the system, rather than just as a kind of um, you know intro video. Uh, so if we click on that, it's going to ask us to flip the uh, laser disc over. And it even automatically ejects the, uh, the player for you and asks, uh, asks you to flip it over.
It's very solicitous about making sure that you've done everything in, in the right order. And I think that's, you can see how uh, sort of clunky it is in a way, you know, because it's, it's in no way kind of smooth to do, to just flip from side to side or to do anything that is sort of out of, outside of this, you know, limited system of jumping from frame to frame, essentially. So here we have, again, another example of, um, you know, basically time delay photography, right? You can see how they erect a circus tent over the course of uh, three hours, um, but you can see it in, you know, a few seconds. So same things apply. Um, you can also, of course, you can slow it down a little bit. You can see how, uh, how it goes down, theoretically at least. Um, and I suppose it's an open question whether this is filmed forwards or in reverse uh, to begin with. That is whether we're watching somebody put up a tent or take it down. So you can see from this again um, how this content is uh, reused throughout the laser disc and how there are different um, the, the, the stuff that they show you in the introduction is essentially scattered throughout the disc as well for you to use as a kind of, um, to create your own sort of interactive multimedia experiences. Um, these are some of my favorite in the sense that I think they really get into the sort of uh, the minutiae of, of, of time, right? So these are kind of classic examples that you've probably seen in other formats like the milk drop um, that shows the dynamics of a drop of milk. I think this is best if we play it uh, pretty slow. Um, but you know the sort of fluid dynamics of what happens when you drop uh, a drop of liquid onto a, a flat surface. And I guess what I really want to emphasize about this is that this is very consciously participating in a long history of using um, moving image technologies to capture this kind of information. Um, even the LaserDisc itself, I guess, you can view as a sort of extension of those kind of early uh, sequential shots of, of animals in motion and things like that, that, um, that essentially move frame by frame, right? The frame by frame movement here is still very important and still very much a part of what's going on. Uh, although this kind of infrastructure that they add, especially the timeline, then allows us to kind of manipulate that in a more, uh, more non-linear fashion. Um, so this is a really interesting thing to me because again, we're at a point where we haven't quite taken all of this and put it on the computer. Uh, we're still dealing with a kind of these notions that go back to the history of the moving image, uh, but we're moving in the direction of totally digitizing all of this, right? Um, and at this point, we're just carrying serial information across between the computer and the LaserDisc player, but it allows us to get into this kind of nonlinear uh, experience of the medium, as opposed to one that is just um, either you know straight forward or straight backward. Here we can do this, and also as um, as I showed, we can control the speed, right? Which gives us a very different experience. I mean, if we jack this all the way up, um, you know, we're not gonna actually see very much. Right, so the computer is only sending control information over the serial port and not data. No that data is being transferred between the laser disc and the computer. Basically, yeah, I mean, you can think of it as meta metadata, I guess. Um, because it's basically telling it, uh, play, pause, stop, and you know, this, from this frame to this frame, and how fast. Um, and there's a lot of technologies at this time, some of which are still in use today, um, but you know, MIDI is another example of something that is kind of like this, although it contains more information, right? It contains actual notes, and sometimes even how the notes are played, how hard uh, the keys are pressed, for example, on a, a keyboard and things like that. Um, this, is, I think, is a much more simpler um, technology than, than MIDI. So there's a kind of progression, if you will, from something like this to something like MIDI to something like the computer being able to do it all as like digital audio workstations today often do. Um, yeah, let's do the 20th century highlighter. So 
as I was uh, discussing, there's a kind of notion of history that's embedded in these as well. Um, and actually a very interesting one in the sense that I find it to be rather balanced for the time. It's I don't see any kind of things that when we look at it today seem super out of place. It, it definitely um, acknowledges a lot of things in history that are, you know, non-flattering to say the United States or to, you know, the people who uh, might be using these, these technologies. Um, but it also kind of, again, creates this sort of smorgasbord of information. Um, you can see here in the 20th century highlighter activity, um, we can choose different decades. Um, and they kind of, when we do, we get sort of a bunch of media content that is associated with that decade. Um, not always in the most sort of uh, connected fashion. So, I mean, if we just pick the 20s, for example, we get some kind of uh, flappers here. We have a quotation that's supposed to sort of sum up the era. And then we have uh, a bunch of different categories to choose from in terms of understanding the, um, the time. So, you know, you get everything from sort of Charles Lindbergh and, you know, uh, exploration, I guess you would call it, um, technology, flight, exploration kind of things, to uh, politics, Herbert Hoover. Um, and then, you know, an acknowledgement of the sort of economic and racial tensions of the period as well, right? So uh, stock market crash, Ku Klux Klan parade. So it's not an attempt to sort of um, revise history or make uh, like a, obscure these kind of uh, less than flattering aspects of, of, of our past. Um, however, it does kind of add this sort of way of looking at everything as sort of jumbled up and juxtaposed very, very randomly, right? So we have um, obviously the famous film Metropolis next to, uh, you know, evangelical baptism in Kansas, singer Bessie Smith, so on and so forth, that kind of creates a sort of um, a strange juxtaposition of what the arts of the 20s were like. Um, there are also some interesting, I think, um, interface elements here. So one thing I noticed if we click on the 60s. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Is that surprisingly for kind of Apple's countercultural uh, cachet, it mostly focuses on the sort of early part of the 60s. If you really want to see the kind of the counterculture uh, in this hypercard stack, at least it's in the 70s, not in the 60s, which, uh, you know, makes a certain amount of sense because what we think of the 60s usually starts in about 1967. Um, but what we get in, in, in the 60s here is this kind of other version of the 60s that's about, uh, you know, the tail end of, um, you know, the sort of the Red Scare and the sort of, you know, fears of communist technology taking over. Um, space program, JFK assassination. Um, and interestingly, there's this kind of, if we click on some of these, you can see the icons are a little different. So this will show you, um, I believe, sound, video. I think this is video with sound. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And then this strange icon here that has kind of the left and right arrows inside the um, film strip. Uh, I believe it's actually sequential images, uh, but they're controlled with the mouse. You can see how the icon changes there on the screen. Um, and then I can drag the mouse to move between these different frames of Marines of Vietnam. Only three, three or four frames, it looks like. Three frames. Um, so again, a kind of innovative, um, although perhaps not particularly uh, compelling, interface technique, right, um, that again makes a little more synchronization between the computer and uh, the LaserDisc player. Again, these kind of um, mishmash of pop cultural moments from the 60s. Beatles footage apparently not uh, riling the ire of the Beatles lawyers at this point, <laughs> despite uh, the long history of litigation between Apple Computer and Apple Music. 
and so on. And then into the 70s, as I said, we get more uh, counterculture. These are all things that, you know, we might, or many of these things are things we might associate with the 60s. Kent State shootings, uh, American Indian movement occupations, so on and so forth. But leading into the kind of post Watergate era um, and the kind of, I guess, decline of the system, you might say. And the 80s are all about computers. So this is where it's, I mean, just because obviously it was made at the tail end of the 80s, this is where its own kind of historical reckoning sort of stops. But you can see it contains things like the, uh, the solidarity movement that would eventually kind of uh, bring down the communist government in Poland, um, as well as uh, the rise of kind of right-wing neoliberalism in Britain and uh, the stock market crash. So again, not really uh, omitting any sort of major ideological blind spots or anything, kind of, you know, a relatively comprehensive, if uh, jumbled up, view of American history. I think the more kind of in world history to a lesser extent, uh, but I think the main kind of thing is precisely that jumbling up and the way that it sort of syncs up with this kind of nonlinear function that uh, the Laserdisc computer setup allows people to create. So this is a more limited uh, activity that shows us kind of the uh, Western settlement of North America from 1606 to 1898, um, allowing again this kind of time manipulation to show the, very, the growth of various settlements and, and, and borders and things of that nature, uh, as well as a kind of timeline that outlines sort of specific um, events. Um, and again, here it's not really trying um, I have no doubt that scholars who are more familiar with uh, the history of Western or North American colonization by the West uh, than I am would would find you know some issues with this, but it basically it doesn't try to uh, you know sweet talk or whitewash that kind of um, historical development. Um, it starts off by explaining that Native Americans occupied the entire continent and formed many different cultures and economies, um, and then goes on to show how. Uh, you know, basically Western colonialism disrupted and changed the landscape uh, that existed before it arrived. Um, and so what you can do is with the Laserdisc player, you can show things like you can superimpose the map of, uh, you know, the contemporary United States on top of this landscape that they're showing you. Uh, it actually it doesn't look like it literally superimposes, but rather shows you a different frame uh, with just the outline of the United States on it. Um, but presumably the idea would be you would be able to remember what it's showing you here in terms of um, colonization to map it up with this, right? Um, similarly, another frame will show you uh, rivers in the, in the North American continent as well. Um, you can navigate between the different time period so you can it shows you how different um, colonial settlements were developed over time and then has here in the the sort of uh, hypercard stack shows you key events that happened during that time period that contributed to the map looking the way that it does um, just to kind of scroll through them all quickly so you can see how the uh, the laser disc content develops. You can see the growth of, uh, you know, what would come to be the United States of America. And its westward expansion. Um, and it also allows you to do, as I've shown with some of the other content, compare these two things. I'm not sure how this works.
Yeah, I'm not really sure how that com comparison works. Maybe you hit that and then you click somewhere in the timeline. Yeah. Huh. That's odd. I think it... It says hold down mouse. That's for these two. Wait, I think like, maybe it progresses while it's... While you're while you have com compare down, I feel like it has to do something with these. Oh, it's or just toggling between them. It's toggling between the two time frames. Oh, I see. So it will compare um, before the one after. either directly before or directly after, right? Yeah, I think that's what it's doing. Yeah. Okay, so you do have to hold it down. You have to hold it down on the plus or the minus um, so you to see compare the with the, the one immediately following or the one immediately Yeah, so you see the independence of Haiti there. It's a minor. Yeah, you do. That's very subtle. <laughs> so, well, go, if you go major to a word, one, world yeah. historical event, <laughs> but because of, the, uh, because of the scale of the imaging, we don't really get to see... It's not very clear. We'll from go the to like maybe 1840 or something, like right before, before and after the Mexican-American War. You might see something big. Oh, that one's not that big. There you go. I mean, that's. Yeah, it would be. Like here, right? Yeah. So from 1840 to 1845, you start to see. Um, or 45, 1845 yeah. to the next one. What year was the Louisiana Purchase? Well, it was purchased before, but I think what they're saying, what this map is really showing, is actual settlement versus on right. the on the map, like on paper, legal. So 1845, it says Mexico yielded claims to Texas and eastern New Mexico. Mexican population increased in California. Texas joined the U.S. Iowa became a state. Um, and then if you compare forward, you can see the sort of uh, U.S. territories on the West Coast there sort of springing up, right? So, I mean, this is kind of an early precursor to, I guess, what we consider now, you know, digital humanities mapping and things of that nature that allow uh, people to see uh, through data visualizations and mapping how, uh, how things have changed over time. Anything else we want to... Um. No, I'm good. What's next? What do you want to look at next? Um, well, let me just look at this real quick again, the counting. Oh, yeah. Oh, this is this crazy. Yeah, this is an interesting... This is like uh, a fully interactive yeah, game almost. This is an interesting activity as well where you're supposed to guess the number of um, marbles in the bowl. And um, whatever you guess, it'll take away that many. So presumably there's a frame per marble or something like that um, until there are none left. Uh, and of course it, you know, it's kind of does interesting things. So, I mean, this is just the normal way. So still a lot of marbles. I forget what, we had it as, but it's, it's. So that's me going over the number it's supposed to do. So that guess was 203 marbles too many. Um, so that's what it does when you go over the number of frames that um, that are allotted for this, right? And then you get this nice uh, message here. Uh, 
you can also randomize it, right? So now it's not the full bowl. So now I, I'm supposed to guess how many this is, right? Um, So that's a kind of a fun thing. Um, actually, let's like that. So again, you can see kind of how they envision the multimedia aspect of this coming into play. It says, think of these objects as video manipulatives, which you can use as you would any other math manipulative. Um, so again, doing math through video, essentially, right? Um, Let's see, we're on side B, so let's look at the Russian dolls. So here we have these Matryoshka dolls, um, and you can decide whether to add or subtract it. Of course, I don't think we can add any more to this. This is the full complement. Yep. Um, and obviously, we can't subtract more than there are in the picture. Oh, no, give me a break this time, though. But again, it's interesting to see how it reacts to the limits, right? Because when you think about it, this is a quite a simple format, right? I mean, we're dealing with like uh, nine frames of video here, essentially, that you can move between in any random order. So, I mean, that's why you can basically pick, you know, like let's remove five, right? Um, and go through it and it'll get you down to that number and then you can add two or whatever and get you back up. Um, but it has to do something when you move out of, you know, the bounds that that it, that it exists that that, it, that are set up, and the bounds are pretty minimal, right? Um, I mean, there's only uh, nine or ten frames to choose from, uh, but it allows you to do this interactivity by being able to pick the number and then having it automatically basically move forward or backward the number of frames that you pick. Yeah, let's look at um, let's let's flip it over and look at the uh, boiling water is also an interesting one. So another kind of counting exercise, but here what's interesting is this kind of transformation of different states, right? So how you move from ice to boiling water, um, and in terms of time, and then you've also got different forms of measurement, right? So you've got the clock, and you've also got a thermometer, which can show you. Um, how hot the water is getting as time goes on. So we're working in five second intervals here. I'm adding 19 at a time. Let's make it a rounder number. So you can see how these things change. I mean, that's what's really interesting is it, it kind of encapsulates within it this notion of kind of historical state change, if you will, right? A state change over time. So how does something move from uh, being a drop of milk to being a splash of milk? How does something move from being ice to being boiling water and so on and so forth? These are all kind of classical problems, both um, in terms of a theory of time and also in terms of you know, philosophy more generally, right? Um, philosophers are often very interested in state change. So you have that all kind of encapsulated in this kind of media product that is basically um, being billed as a way to manipulate time, essentially, right? A way to kind of uh, interact with media that allows you to uh, manipulate time instead of experience it in a linear format. So it's interesting because Apple's digital video format is going to be named QuickTime at around, I think QuickTime is being developed at the same time that this came out. Sure, yeah. Um, so, I mean, it seems like, I think that it's probably one of those situations where despite here we are looking at a video of state change, uh, you, can, you can actually map those connections, right? So the move from this to QuickTime 
I mean, QuickTime allows you to do all of those things as well, and in some ways probably allows you to do it much more programmatically um, in the sense that you can embed a video somewhere and then um, you know, uh, create that same code for manipulating and that you have here, but you have to do it over the serial interface, right? Um, what, so there's a kind of a gradual transition from one to the other, but I do think there's kind of a, um, if one wanted to argue for a break, the break would be that QuickTime is a fully digital um, you know, system for manipulating media, right? Whereas this is kind of, you know, as we can see, is, is, is in multiple pieces and requires kind of this connection between a computer and a um, laser disc player. I guess something we didn't really mention before, but it's probably worth talking about. Um, I don't have the exact numbers off the top of my head, but this is not a cheap setup. I mean, we're talking four or $5,000 um, in, you know, 1989 dollars, which is, you know, much more than that today. So this isn't something that is quite ready for the masses yet, even though it's sort of, um, even though it's sort of put out that way. Um, it's, it, you know, in order to get kind of, you know, a device that this can all just work on seamlessly um, and have everybody use, the cost has to come down as well. So this is, you know, you can still view this as kind of a prototype in that regard. Yeah, I think we were seeing like some of the, the videos about this that we were seeing show them primarily in either classrooms or corporate presentation settings. Yeah, it seems like the main sort of markets were classrooms. Um, and I don't know how many of those there were. I mean, I don't think the Visual Almanac was something that you could really buy. I think it was something that Apple would give to you on, on some way or another. Um, and then the other market was um, for Apple's own sales force to give presentations to people on how they might, they might use technologies, which might not include using this exact technology, right? You could say, here's a, you know, you can use HyperCard to, I think one of the examples that we saw on the, um, the Apple business disc was, you can use HyperCard to, you know, keep track of your inventory, and here's a video on how this company did that, right? So that wouldn't necessarily be something that companies would be buying to make their own videos, but rather something that an Apple salesperson, I don't know how it would work, you'd have to lug in some, like, you know, all this equipment, but then an Apple salesperson could come and show you, um, here's what you can do with our technology, right? Um, I don't think it had much traction in the long run, because as you can see, it's, it's a lot of work to get all that going. The LaserDisc player, this is a Pioneer uh, LDV 8000. I think that's. Um, I think we found it. It was like $2,000. $2,000 yeah. for that. Monitors. <laughs> Mon TV. Yeah, the monitor, the TV. Yeah. Yeah, it all adds so up. So it adds up pretty quickly. Yeah. But, but on the other hand, this is not like research stuff. These are all things that you can buy off the shelf, right? Like the. The protocols that the computer is using to, to control the LaserDisc player, the LaserDisc player has built in three modes um, of playback, the third of which is full computer control. So that's all standardized across the industry. LaserDisc player had, had been around for about a decade already at this point. So we're looking at technology that is already out there, that's already standardized, that's already in the marketplace. Um, and so it's not like this is bleeding edge technology. Yeah, I imagine that that the hardest thing to get would be the actual CD-ROM and LaserDisc from the Apple Multimedia Lab. If you had the money, if money was no object, you know, you're right. This is all standard technology. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's the same technology that powers, for instance, the LaserDisc-based video games of the 80s. So Dragon's Lair, Space Ace, those cliffhanger, those kind of things uh, were predicated upon a similar kind of technology where you would have a joystick or whatever and a couple buttons and depending on how you, you know, how you press them and at what time you press them, uh, you know, the, the computerized hardware of an arcade console would communicate to a laser disc player that was buried within it, uh, jump to this point, right? And then you would see the next scene or you would see the death scene if you, if you didn't do it properly or so on and so forth. Um, I don't know what other kind of uses there were for this technology. I mean, it's a very interesting technology uh, to kind of have this sort of asynchronous system. Um, but that's the one that I, certainly jumps out to me is that, you know, and those are a little older than the Apple LaserDisc system itself. So yeah, this is all kind of off the shelf in that regard. But in another way, uh, you know, I think the uses are pretty limited. So it, it seems very esoteric to us from today. It's not, um, you know, it's not as, as you know, uh, 
understandable as a CD-ROM drive or something, let's say. Right, yeah. I think another interesting use of LaserDisc players is in museum kiosks, uh, the mm -hmm. Computer Museum in Boston, the precursor to the Computer History Museum, um, actually used laser discs in, in some of its displays. Um, yeah. The other notable thing about LaserDisc is that uh, it's where things like the Criterion Collection originated, right? So the idea of having high quality video transfer uh, before the DVD revolution was really a LaserDisc thing. And so if you were a um, you know, video file, you, would, you might have a LaserDisc player just because it had offered higher quality um, and, and the ability to do things like uh, add extras. Um, perhaps on, on a second side, or perhaps even potentially interactively. Um, so yeah, I mean, the laser disc itself you know, can be used to just show video, but the interactivity, I think, is something um, that was much, much less frequently used, um, although it must have had some, it must have been used enough for them to define a standard for it, right, and to define all the different um, commands and all the different ways that you could communicate between a computer and a laser disc player. Sorry, if I don't know the sequence you've done it, but you have you mentioned the Aspen movie map, which started? Uh, no, we have not. Yes, because that, from what the Aspen people told us, now maybe there's somebody else that did it that they're not crediting, but they said that uh, I think it probably is because it was very close to when the laser disc was started to be sold, and so they did around 1980, and I think a laser disc is from the late 70s, right? And they said that they were the ones that kind of hacked it to get computer control to work. Mm -hmm. So it was sold as pretty much a video format. And they were at that time using, this is what became the, the Media Lab at MIT, but the machine architecture or something group. Um, but they used a mini computer to control the laser disk. And this was for basically Google Maps with Street View. But um, I believe that they pioneered the idea of computer control. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the steps were between that and the fact that by now the you have it built in as a standard yeah. ready to go. I also, personally, I'm a little confused why you would need a CD-ROM and a LaserDisc. In other words, is that just because Apple wanted to show off their new CD-ROM drives or couldn't, wasn't the stack small enough it would fit on uh, floppy disks? The stack is small. We'd have to check if it was small enough I, uh, to put on a floppy, but they put I a bunch of I don't think other it's stuff. small enough. The, yeah. There's there's a, there's multiple stacks on the CD-ROM. That's okay. the thing. It's like they would add other software on there as well. Um, so there's a lot of demos, a lot of other things that are unrelated to the LaserDisc player even, just other like demonstrations of the HyperCard technology essentially without the, the LaserDisc aspect. Well, th there is a whole separate stack that is a tutorial about how you might create an interactive LaserDisc stack of your own mm. um, called the Video LaserDisc the Toolkit or the Video Developer Toolkit. That's, yeah, we can see that in Finder. So yeah, I mean, we can look at it. But so this is, this is just the stuff related to the, uh, the, the LaserDisc, like the Visual Almanac, right? Yeah, um, that's 24 megabytes. So it's 24 megabyte. megs. Which is small for a CD, but obviously That's way right. too large That's for a floppy. That's too large for a floppy. Yeah. Um, right. And then these are the other things that Hanson was talking about. This is the Video Disk Toolkit, um, which is a similar uh, hypercard stack that allows a little more uh, full control, right? Of so yeah, go to set player type, because it'll show you all the players that are supported. And this is a longer list. It might even include the one we have, right? It does not. <laughs> no. Okay. But, yeah. Yeah, that only includes 4,200. Uh, yeah, it doesn't include the 8,000. We found another stack, right? The, um, yeah, it was the uh, Conflict in the Holy Land. Yeah, uh, the stack. ABC one. Yeah. The, the that listed it in the documentation. This. Yeah. Okay, so this just gets us back to here, though. Why oh, you went that? back to here? Huh. But I presume most of the CD is empty, right? I mean, it's only... Well, only uh, you could put in the CD-ROM itself. You haven't actually mounted it. Okay, because what is the I CD in there? It's not in there. Hanson, is it, is it mostly because QuickTime was not ready? I mean, they couldn't do the video on the CD-ROM because they didn't yet have a format. Yeah, correct? and they didn't have the compression was, right. the, was the key thing, the road pizza compression yeah. codec. 
It's just all um, the same stuff that's in um, in this. Yeah, folder I, here. I copied the entire contents of the CD to so the So this hard total disk. folder is like twenty-seven right. megs essentially. So that it's sitting there mostly empty. Mm -hmm. Mostly empty. Theoretically, they could put all the video and lots more on it, but they just didn't have the formats for it. It's a hybrid CD-ROM that includes um, a data track and then an audio track that you can put into any C uh, standard CD player, and the uh, audio on that part of the track is the same audio that's on the Laserdisc, so it, it's mirrored um, on both. And I mean, that again sort of utilizes the most of every medium, right? So again, this kind of a concept of multimedia still in the sort of more 60s vein of separate media, but sort of starting to come together, right? So you have audio on the CD, you have video and audio on the Laserdisc, you have a little bit of audio on the HyperCard stack, but not really any animation yeah. per se. But you also have, I mean, you have that CD audio toolkit, which I think is the same thing, but instead of controlling video on the Laserdisc player, it controls audio in the CD-ROM drive itself. Right, so it uses the same concept, which is jump to this particular timestamp on the disc um, and play this, that, or the other. So one of the uh, sample compositions that the Visual Almanac includes is a making of, um, which is kind of interesting. It shows you why they made it, how they made it, and who they are. Um, so it gives you a kind of example of what the Apple Multimedia Lab itself was at this time. And kind of, again, uses this sort of, uh, you know, mixed between HyperCard stack and LaserDisc kind of scenario. So. If you want to see, I guess, this animation of DNA is sort of supposed to relate to their own kind of inspiration for creating this. Almost as if, again, you know, the sort of elements of DNA coming together, there's an analogy to be drawn between that and the elements of different media that um, the visual almanac allows you to, to cut and paste together. Um, indeed, the basis of the system would be a library of images. So we talked to people to see what kind of images would be most useful to them. pages that you would go to that would just start playing a, like a little song or something when you got to them. It has that same sort of very associative quality between uh, the media, because I guess that's, you know, that's the new thing, right? I mean, that's, that's basically what they're trying to uh, show or uh, demonstrate here is, is the ability to kind of pull in different media sources and connect them uh, in whichever way you would like. Um, so they show you these are some of the places that they um, that they pulled the information that they put on the Laserdisc from. Um, notice the kind of, a lot of sort of educational kind of resources, right? So both educational television libraries and museums, but stock images, um, independent filmmakers, uh, by which I don't think they mean like art filmmakers, but rather. Stuff like this kind of, is that? some kind of stop motion animation. Got a lot of scientific research and a little bit of um, government agencies.
that same content you can get at through the duration activity as well. Yeah, I mean, this is con this content is reused multiple times, which is one of the reasons why it seems like there's so much content on the Laserdisc is because you can encounter it several different ways in the course of you know manipulating the stack, right? Um, this may be the weather thing that we looked at earlier. Yeah. Oh. So repetition also plays a part in kind of um, understanding how much media is put on this or how the experience of multimedia as this kind of experience of putting different clips together, um, how it creates so much, how it feels like it, ha it has so much content on it. Um, and then interestingly, this is some of the stuff that they created themselves. Uh, I guess maybe we can um, connect this with when we go and actually show the teeter-totter thing, but this is the teeter-totter uh, footage that they filmed that shows you again when you use this in the interactive version you're getting these as individual frames rather than as this kind of like sort of like hip PBS style music video of if you can imagine the Tom Tom soundtrack production still yeah, they show you how they, how, you know, kind of how they made it too. You can notice the sort of, you know, it's not digital cameras or anything like that. It's it's very old school. Um, you can imagine that this had to be like, you know, very uh, tightly directed because what they're going for is precisely, you know, they're not really going for a film. They're going for these individual shots that show the different relations of weight between the two different sides of the teeter-totter so that they can then create this kind of interactive um, hypercard stack that allows you to learn about balance and learn about, you know, math essentially by using the teeter-totter as a visual example. Oh, so that's how they did the planetary highway. So yes, this is using uh, footage from the California Highway Patrol, I believe, to um, to make an analogy to uh, you know outer space distances, right? <laughs> and this explains how the different um, video soundtracks or sound tracts, um, as they're, they're called here, uh, can be superimposed or used alongside the same footage. Some basic principles of physics can be demonstrated with a pot of cornstarch. Ah, oh, jeez. So again, here we can repeat the same video footage with different sound footage, uh, sound recording, um, which again opens up sort of multiple viewings and repetition in a way that makes it seem like there's more content on the disc than there would be if you just watched it start to finish. Sound effects. And then and this is where it gets really interesting because it starts to show you how to set this up how computers work and who the people who made it are. Oh. You can see the teeter-totter example there as well.
And you can see how much work went into this too. I just saw one of the people involved with the Aspen movie map on there. Mm -hmm. okay. Michael Nymark. Hmm. I think that's it. Yeah, this is kind of interesting because if you click on this one on the right, you get the video we just watched. But if you click on this one on the left, it jumps to the first frame. And then I guess you're supposed to use the actual video disc controls oh, if yeah. you want to see the credits in you know slower detail. Hmm. So that's the other thing is that there's a kind of interest. There's always the possibility of sort of jumping back to the laser disc method of controlling. Um, the player that I think works, you know, pretty much on stop. Like you can have it play here too, and get a sense of exactly how fast this is going by. Um, and then it continues to play through the rest of the lasers. Right. <laughs> yeah, we should show some of the um, some of the crew. Again, more production stills. Oh, they went to Great America to film those, the roller coaster and, and the, the, the edge rides. Great little slices of life on what it would have been like to work for a company like Apple in the late 80s. Well, yeah, they're all using Mac SEs there, so that's a, a cheaper computer than the 2CI. <laughs> and then that's just the introduction that we already watched. Um, you do wanna, you want to do the tutor Yeah, let's go back yeah. to the tutor. So this is uh, one of the first activities, the playground physics activity, um, that allows uh, students to understand basic kind of physical principles, such as the balancing on a teeter-totter. So what this activity allows you to do is move the people around on the teeter-totter to show you how balance works, essentially. You can drag and drop people or weights. And it shows you on the screen what happens. So if we move 
this person up, the distribution of weight changes. And each one of these corresponds with a different frame in the uh, in the laser disk. So basically, all of these combinations and permutations are worked out across a series of, of frames. Um, seems like a lot, but in terms of number of frames, I mean, if you think 24 to 30 frames per second, um, you can store all of that information on a laser disk quite easily. And then you can also you know, just different ways of doing the same thing allow you to basically reuse this content. Let's see, we know that this will be like that, so. So yeah, you can see some of the repetition at work here as well that allows this, you know, these however many frames, 100 frames or whatever it is, to uh, be reused in multiple activities and multiple kind of ways of experiencing that content. Do you want to check out the Encyclopedia of Multimedia? Yeah. Okay. Let me let me add one note to that just to finish. Uh, the so Michael Nymark or Neymark was involved in Aspen, and it says here that he was also one of the founders of the Apple Multimedia Lab. So there is a direct connection. So this is the Encyclopedia of Multimedia, which is another one of these uh, hybrid LaserDisc CD-ROM combinations. Uh, as you can see, this one is a little more colorful using, we think, um, extra tools to basically put uh, color content on top of the normal black and white hypercard stacks. Um, this one also, yeah. you know, and Yeah, it would probably be like an X command, which is a, a kind of a plugin that you could write. You can write code outside of HyperCard um, little programs that then interface with HyperCard. And yeah, so HyperCard has a standard plugin interface called the X command, X commands. Okay. So that gives us a little more colorful of an interface than, um, than in the uh, Visual Almanac. But this is similarly kind of designed to showcase multimedia and this particular, you know, at this time basically multimedia was synonymous with this kind of hybrid setup for, for the Apple Multimedia Lab. Um, this kind of spends a little more time than the Visual Almanac does on what multimedia is, how it works. Um, through this kind of hypercard stack process, not really using the laser disk that much. Um, you can see both the kind of uh, nonlinear navigation system that's involved in hypercard stacks and hypermedia of any kind for that matter, um, but also some of the sort of uh, strange interface conventions that didn't really make it to the next level um, in the sense that it can sometimes be a little difficult to tell what uh, what's clickable and what's not.
this one lets you see a little more of the sort of capabilities of HyperCard itself. You can see how this is um, outlining all of the different components that basically are the components that we're using in our setup here today. Um, required to have the uh, full multimedia experience. Mm, we don't have speakers connected to our laser, No, we don't have speakers, so we don't have a video capture card. Is the CD-ROM required? I think so. Oh, that's interesting. It does oh, not show not. the CD-ROM. No, it though. doesn't. No, and I noticed in the pictures some of the people did not have a CD-ROM. Hmm. I guess they just had really large hard drives. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, presumably there were, you know, networking capabilities and stuff. So if you had some other way of moving 25 megabytes from one computer to another, you wouldn't need the laser to, or the CD. This set, oh, th there were two setups. Did you see that? Um, mm -hmm. Interactive video disc, CD-ROM. So this oh, is, appears to be the Macintosh 2 CD-ROM. So this would be the one that... Yeah. Okay. Mm. So they're doing one, one setup for the CD-ROM with an audio or data CD and then a different setup for the Laserdisc. Preparing a CD-ROM requires large amounts of mass storage. A typical mass storage device is the Apple HD-80SC, an 80 megabyte hard disk. That's particularly interesting when you think about the fact that the capacity of a CD-ROM is around 650, 700 megabytes. Um, so that's really even, you know, only a fraction of that um, on the hard disk there. But and then that was the largest hard disk you could get in, an, in a Macintosh um, internally. Yeah, and that gets into what made the CD-ROM revolution, as it were, so exciting, is, is that you were literally looking at you know, mass producible items that could contain, you know, five times the amount you could contain on a hard drive that would cost you, you know, yeah, many, many times what a, what a CD would cost you. They were slow, but they were huge storage. Yeah, and that contributes to all sorts of things. I, I will have to look if it's this one or the, um, I believe it is in uh, uh, Encyclopedia Multimedia CD-ROM. There's just a ton of demo software, so you can see almost instantaneously what people were doing or thought they would do with that space. And that later on contributed to this kind of notion of what people called shovelware, right? Where you would just be like, oh, you know, we have all this space, what do we do with it? Let's put anything on it that we can, right? Um, so you can already see that on here where they contain uh, demo HyperCard stacks of various things. Uh, it was partially a promotional and sales tool. So you would get the demo version of the HyperCard stack and if you liked it, you would have the information to, uh, I mean, I guess at that time you would mail order the actual full version and they would send you another CD-ROM with that on it. Um, but yeah, so CD-ROMs were a kind of dramatic change in the amount of storage and therefore the amount of information that a computer could access, right? Um, I mean, they seem very small to us now, even, you know, even any kind of, uh, any halfway decent broadband you can download you know, 650, 700 megabytes, like no problem. But at the time, especially a huge innovation compared to uh, 80 megabyte hard drives, for sure. Definitely compared to the floppy disk, which. Yeah, if you want to think 1. about 1.4 megabytes. Of media. Yeah. Well, the closest removable competition was uh, SideQuest and things like that. But Magneto they were optical. 44 megabyte. Magneto, they were pretty. They, they existed, but they were. Expensive. Not as common. I mean, they, they had format issues. They were all different. Oh, right. Bernoulli was a different format than Cyclist. And but so in 89, CD-ROMs were still very expensive. So you can see here there's, like, kind of a problem with the navigation. You can there is, there is navigation up here somewhere, isn't there not? Yeah. It lets you go back. But this takes you back to the last card you were in. Uh, there we go. Head home. Encyclopedia Multimedia. So it's interesting that, you know, the kind of navigation scheme that we're all really familiar with through the web browser um, is not necessarily totally intuitive or not something that was just automatically kind of implemented, but rather developed out of all of these different and, um, you know, in retrospect, much more complicated attempts to impose some kind of navigation system on this nonlinear experience, right? Um, 
But there, interestingly, there is a notion of a home card or a home stack, just like there was on, for a home page. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of the, there's there's that there's back, you know, there's recent, there's these first, previous, next, and last. There's all sorts of, I mean, you, you see the same skeleton there, but the pieces aren't put together in the same way. And uh, I mean, I think perhaps just because we live in the middle of it, it, this is a very relativist comment, but like as intuitive a way. I mean, if you're used to using a web browser, you're not necessarily going to know what to do with this. But for instance, the next and previous buttons were, that's an example of where early web browsers had those, and they anticipated people using more of a CD-ROM model where you're going through a stack of kind of pre, mm -hmm. pre-made content. Right. That was dropped by Mosaic and some of the later, more popular ones. Mm -hmm. And the the what well, what you're saying is now a simplified or a intuitive model. Some of that evolved over time, even within the web. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. But I think you notice it a lot more when you remove the web browser, you know, interface as well. When you're not, when you're thinking, when you, when you separate hypertext from web browsing, or when you think about, you know, this is a different way of navigating through hypertext or hypermedia. Um, you can see that it doesn't necessarily have to follow any of the conventions of the browser, yeah. right? Yeah, and this was like, one of dozens of hypertext systems at the time. Yeah, and there are a couple others on the demo CD. Um, you know, we'll dig around here a little more, but there was uh, there's one at Brown University, for instance. That Intermedia. Was, uh, yeah, Intermedia. There was Owl Guide, there's Microcosm, there's... But there's a demo of the Intermedia thing on here, and uh, it shows you, it tells you what to do, and you can see it's a multi-step process to get any, you know, connection between any two elements. Um, oh, to make a link. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, it's, it, you know, it, you would really have to explain to someone the relationship between that and, say, the World Wide Web, because it's not clear from just the interface and how it tells you to put it together. You would not necessarily think that these are working with the same set of concepts or technologies. But authoring in, hyper t in HyperCard also takes very different steps than browsing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and text is not clickable. You have to create buttons that, yeah, like that are clickable. For everything, yeah. basically. Yeah, and you, you, you put the buttons over the text that you want to be clickable. But yeah, HyperCard has this notion of like, there is a linear order to the cards in the stack. Right. So you can always go to the next card or the previous card. Right. Even right. By just by hi hitting the arrow keys. Even if that isn't something that you would put <coughs> in the actual UI of the yeah. stack. Yeah. You wouldn't necessarily put that in the UI, but you could always hit the arrow keys to go to the next card. Right. And that's different than back and forward on a browser, because next, it's just right. pre-designed pre by the creator of the stack. And that's actually interesting. Uh, thanks for reminding me of that, Hanson, because in some ways, it's a lot easier to navigate through this little kind of like PowerPoint setup that they have here of the different sort of bullet points of why multimedia and what technology with the arrow keys than it is with any of this kind of apparatus that they have set up for the various clicking and things. Um, as you can see here, you know, this is describing um, the features of, of HyperCard. Side. Oh, so it gives you a little bit of the HyperTalk uh, script to control the LaserDisc. Yeah, so the idea being that HyperCard is a lot easier for people who aren't programmers to understand than, uh, uh, than competing systems. Well, the write is something to do with the LaserDisc itself, right? Well, it's showing that these are both ways of controlling the LaserDisc player right. in the different languages. And it's saying, like, mm -hmm. look, this is like... <laughs> Three lines of code. <laughs> I mean... You know, it's interesting. Of course, at some point, you have to tell it which COM port to use. So presumably, there's some other place or some other way to tell it. Yeah. You know, Just that that's all embedded somewhere else. That, that information. Yeah. Um, Essentially, but, you're making one call that does, a whole, does all that other stuff under the hood. And that, yeah. So that is what, 10 so again, lines versus or 8 lines versus yeah, that's, that's 40, why. 50 lines. Much longer, yeah.
See, this is the part where now you're like, okay. Let's go to the next oh, part. They have this, this, uh, uh, is that home? No. It goes, oh, no, no, it, it says it's up, so I don't know what that means. I guess pop. Yeah, this is another very I guess it's a, well, there is a push pop model too, because it's a stack, right? So mm -hmm. there is the notion of you can push a card or a pop a card. So you can navigate down a hierarchy and then pop all back up. So there's, I mean, I don't know, there's back, up, forward, and then I don't really know what this is. Jump. Okay. So this is an example of the kind of um, user interface that, again, you know, would be predating web browsers and um, made for a lot of the same purposes, but not necessarily um, intuitive to people who are used to using a web browser. But it's got the same kind of features back, forward, so on and so forth. Is that like, are you creating like a bookmark or something? Yeah, those must be ways of. Cost differences, Mac yeah. versus DOS. Did you want to see that? Sure. Let's see. Yeah, let's see. How, how are they justifying the, uh, the increased cost of the Mac? Well, I, I guess if you're doing media integration but with a DOS computer, you're going to end up yeah, purchasing you a lot have of to extra put on equipment. So much anyway. extra stuff. Yeah, so sound cards. The sound card. Video cards. One hundred fifty dollars yeah. on Mac, a thousand dollars on DOS. Animation up to two thousand dollars, depending on the software. Video. That might actually be. I mean, that, for multimedia, there's a lot of truth to that at the time. Yeah. PCs yeah, came with zero for that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's, it, most PCs in 1989 did not include a sound card, so I mean, you had to lay out extra for that. There was no nothing like HyperCard on the PC, certainly not for free, like or you know that ships with the operating system or whatever. So, yeah, this was definitely a market that they were. Um, you being aggressive about being the best in and, and you know, touting that fact. Um, you want to check? Yeah, go that one. This is a kind of interesting um, area where they show kind of how multimedia has developed. It goes through uh, some computing history uh, as well as what's possible with these technologies and also includes some kind of uh, guesses of what the future may hold. Oh, I wonder if, oh, I know, looks like it's okay. I w actually, I don't think we have the CD-ROM in there. Yeah, we don't. Let me go put in the cd -ROM. So this is a little kind of glossary explaining these terms. Well, actually, I can't change the CD-ROM unless we go back to the finder. Yeah, I'll stop in a second. So here you see a kind of interesting uh, multimedia and new media are considered kind of the same thing in, in, in their glossary, at least. Um, all meaning more than text. And then you get this kind of s setup here where it shows you some of the sort of um, things from the past. It's not showing the color versions. It is not. You're right. It could be because we don't have the CD-ROM in there. or Let's, let's switch to the CD-ROM and just to see. Are you supposed to run this off the CD-ROM? I don't quite remember. Okay. I think you're supposed to run it from the from the hard disk, but then I think not all the content is on the hard disk.
feel like we didn't use the CD ROM before, though. Um. Hmm. I mean, it can't hurt. I'm yeah. just saying, I feel like we were able to get it. Yeah, but you can just launch it from the hard disk. Launch it from the hard disk still? Yeah, launch it from the hard disk still, but, but it'll... You can see all this other stuff on it, Mark, like uh, this university demos and stuff. This has oh, like the, the intermedia. intermedia demo. It has, like I mean, a lot more than that, but yeah. Oh, actually, yeah, I'd be interested to see what... Uh, intermediate demo, yeah. Well, what else is there? Uh, uh, just a ton of stuff. This is very weird because this is all educational. So this is all like stuff that universities have developed. But we don't know what their what hypertext program they're in. Uh, they're, they're all, all in hypertext. They're all most of them are hypertext. Yeah. Some of them are except for intermediate. Except for intermediate. Um, but intermediate yeah. ran under AUX. How on earth did they get it running here? Yeah, I'll show it to you. I think it's just a mock-up. This is demo. Yeah. I mean, it basically died when AUX died. I guess it's yes. Now. Intend to give you an impression of the few features. Oh, it says that it used SuperCard. True, I remember SuperCard. Oh, they ported it to SuperCard. I guess okay. I guess that's what they did. Yeah, it says yes as a SuperCard project. By the way, the author of this, Norm Meyerowitz, uh, we have an oral history with him. If he also did Shockwave, uh, worked for Macromedia. Yeah, I, I, I know. I, I used to work for Macromedia, so um, right. You know, I don't, I don't know if he'd remember me, but I know Norm. You know, I yeah, know Norm. so I mean, we have the oral history if it's of any interest, but you probably know that. I was stuff. just looking at that on my phone, like two okay. seconds ago, <laughs> yeah. Because I was thinking about this, like the, I did want to show this, just as another example of kind of a, um, <coughs> of a hypermedia uh, application. Um, so you can see, yeah, this is a demo of the intermedia system developed at Brown University, uh, designed to run on the AUX Unix platform. Um, which, but is here, Apple's which is Apple's version, version of, Unix. of Unix. Yeah. Um, but here ported uh, through a, a technology called SuperCard to run on um, Mac OS or System 6. Yeah. Um, SuperCard is just a third party, more sophisticated clone of HyperCard. Which I think lets you get away from the, the uh, card format. In other words, you could do. Like intermedia was whole pages rather than cards. This seems much more, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, like object oriented than card oriented, uh, as you can see. So it has, a, it kind of walks you through how you would set up a web, which would be, I guess, like a stack. Oh um, right, it used the word web. And, interesting. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it, it's a very interesting. No, system. I've been looking for the origins of the use of the word web. Um, <laughs> but it so it tells you how to do it. So click on this. Now choose file from the open menu. It says double clicking is not supported in the demo, but is supported in the actual version. So as soon as you click that open, it then gives you like the next step, right? Um, so it tells you what to do. Um, click on the intro track to select this, select open, click on the link marker, the small arrow above the box titled picture. Once it's highlighted, choose follow from the intermediate menu. Wow. This is not very intuitive at all. <laughs> yeah, it's a this little closer to like the World Wide Web browser, the original, the original next Tim Berners-Lee Berners Next browser. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can see it's multiple windows. It's not one screen that then with the card navigation takes place kind of behind the scenes. You only see one thing at a time. Um, and yeah, you have to create a, a series of kind of links between these different windows in order to have kind of a, um, you know, something to navigate through. But this, is, we're in navigation or authoring? It's I think it's authoring. I, I think they're kind of, I don't know for sure, but I think they're kind of one and the same, or at least in the demo, they certainly are, you know? Yeah, there's um, no separation. I know two-way links were a big feature of this. That's always been the dream, hasn't it? <laughs> yep.
So you can see this is quite a complicated process. User addition. How many steps are there? So that was the 10-step demonstration for basically how to create a link and then follow it. Okay. But I will say creating links, I mean, HyperCard isn't that easy, is it? I mean, creating and following are yeah, that's yeah. different yeah. levels yeah. of difficulty. Right. And of course, most web browsers, you can't create one anyway, so. Yeah. Should I go back to the stack? Yeah, but you may want to look into that if you're, you know, I mean, you may want to play around more with that. Demo. Definitely, yeah. i would never seen the SuperCard version of it. Yeah. So yeah, but back to this guy. You get things like that as well. The feedback for when you've really clicked on something isn't always. I guess that the use of the color makes it a lot slower. Wow. This definitely worked before. Maybe I need to. Oh, no, it did work. Yeah, but we've. Oh, there, oh, we, go. there we go. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah, nice. Okay. Now the color is overlaid. So yeah, back to the part where we were talking about how this part of the stack shows uh, both the, the past, present, and future of, of hypermedia. Um, you know, I, this is very interesting to me as well. You get some, um, some, some key kind of moments in the history of hypermedia, um, mostly overlooking the, the name that we now probably most associate with it, which is Ted Nelson. It doesn't really talk about um, the Xanadu project or, or Ted Nelson's notion of hypertext, um, but it does uh, show uh, Vannevar Bush's concept of the Memex, more almost impressionistic view of sort of the history of media technologies than like a deep dive into the memex itself, which was, you know, always a kind of um, fictional or imagined device rather than an actual. Yeah, that's like a card sorter or something. Yeah, it was a microfilm uh, yeah. displayer that could create associative links between different. Although you, you may know the, the real memex was built the 20s, uh, Zeiss Icon by uh, a fellow named Goldberg. I don't, I don't know this. Yeah. Name. So I mean, they, it was actually patented a microfilm selector like Bush uh, wanted to do, but si single one, not two, which you could make links. So a single one, but using photocells to read the um, holes in the edge of the film, hmm. and it was built into a desk. Hmm. Was he aware of that, do you know? Well, when he tried to patent the Memex, he was. <laughs> they, he wasn't allowed to patent it. But not when he was. Uh, it's not uh, clear. Uh, it's really a mystery, which we'll probably never know. You think of the Laserdisc as a, 
a giant memex. <laughs> in a way. I mean, yeah, this is why all of these kind of histories uh, are, are relevant, you know, is because it's the same thing, essentially. Uh, I mean, I guess with the hypercard stack, you could create links between different laser disks, but uh, otherwise you would be doing the same thing that you were just describing, which is that you would be creating links between different portions of the same, you know, tape, as it were, um, different frames. So yeah, but but I would think that is to me what Bush's big contribution that was to make the the link a really big part of it. Right, right. I mean, it's the whole idea is is that for um, I mean, it was supposed to basically mimic in technology the associative process of researching so that you could recreate your thought train as you went through multiple sources to find out whatever it is that you, you were trying to find out. Um, in some ways, we still don't have that today. <laughs> you know? uh, even though we have, I mean, we do in the sense of we have browser histories, but we don't in the sense of like, I want to recreate this one well, or journey to of knowledge that I took. Or to share and iterate on other people's, that's what's really missing today. Yeah. So we have Vannevar Bush. We also have uh, Doug Engelbart's famous interactive uh, demonstration. In uh, what I find to be a surprisingly high quality clip of this compared to the things that are uh, circulating around today mostly. Um, but this is full uh, video of a short segment. Of I've got this file that's structured. If I want to see what's in there, I can walk down. levels and see go to produce they get big I'd like to say one branch only and uh, let me look just that low and I see it but there's another thing I can do with a picture drawing capability and here's the route I seem to have to go to to pick up all the materials but if I want to I can say the library what am I supposed to pick up there I can just point to that and oh I see overdue books go back what if I what am I supposed to pick up at the drugstore Hmm, I see, very safe. So, Bill, will you come in through this intercom? Hello, Doug. Hi. I need to know what terminal you're on, Bill. 13. Okay. I'd like to have him see my text, and he can point to it, but we've carefully reserved for me the right to control and operate on this, so my bug is more powerful than yours. <laughs> but we can have an argument. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what they call a bug fight. Now, computer, do the automatic switching that will bring in a camera picture from the camera mounted on his console, such as the camera mounted on mine. Is. Hi, Bill. That's great. Now we're connected. Audio, you can see my words, you can point at it, and I can see your face, and we can talk. There's this one, which I don't think is the Aspen movie map, but it is. Oh, it's MIT. That's right. So it's MIT Media Lab? Oh, really? Yeah, this oh. is an example of how to use uh, computerized instruction to do real world tasks, like in this case, uh, changing an oil pan on a car. Um, uh. I can browse around by touching other parts of the transmission and continue to get descriptions for each of these chapters. When I find the chapter that I want to see, I just touch the text, and the system will format pages for me to read. First thing to do is to loosen up the bolts carefully, not too far out. Front bolts preferably. Uh, don't loosen them too far. If you loosen them too far, you'll have a big mess. If the bolts are too loose, the pan may tilt open suddenly, spilling oil beyond the drip. So again, early interactive touch screen, so we can think of this as a precursor to our iPads and phones, um, as well as a kind of another example of how this is used as instructional media, specifically. Um, so that's kind of the, the past that they're sort of referencing. And again, I think you know, time and space is very limited here, but it's, it's notable that they don't talk about Ted Nelson's hypertext um, at all. Um, you wanna go to soon first before we go back to now? Sure, so this is how they envision the future. Um, most of us uh, may be familiar with the Apple Knowledge Navigator, but this is uh, kind of the, this particular clip I'd never seen before of a, a similar technology um, that they're envisioning as would be kind of the next step on from the uh, multimedia LaserDisc uh, CD-ROM hybrids that, that are state-of-the-art circa 1989-1990.
So I think this is like a part of the Knowledge Navigator thing. It's certainly Knowledge Navigator-esque, but uh, whereas the Knowledge Navigator video shows kind of a, um, you know, a college professor, a sort of very, uh, you know, advanced knowledge economy type person, you know, integrating a very variety of data. Uh, this is designed to teach uh, literacy to adults who, um, who, uh, who have never learned to read, essentially. A lot of times, someone who's 30 or 40 years old is so ashamed of not being able to read uh, that uh, the, the interaction with other people may be quite intimidating, whereas the computer is not. After filling the engine with oil, the coil wire should be grounded and the engine cranked by the starter motor until the oil What's this word? Pressure. Oh, pressure. Until the oil pressure gauge reads 10 pounds. Would you like to go on to lesson six? Uh, no, I, I want to read this. begin an important home stand tonight. So it's an example of showing kind of the seamless transliteration between sound, image, and text, essentially, right? Um, you can take a picture of a newspaper and turn it into words, and then the computer will know the words and help you read them, uh, and it will listen to your voice to know that you said the words correctly. So. Um, you know, an example of multimedia is precisely the integration of all of those things and what that might be able to help people do that they had not been able to do before. So, no, I mean, this is, this, is more, this is a vision statement. Obviously, this technology didn't exist at the time and in some ways doesn't really exist now. So uh, I, I think this is interesting of what they're projecting into the future as like where this is going to lead in t 10, 20 years. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that you don't hear that much about um, literacy efforts with, you know, say the iPad, even though presumably there are, you know, there are some that do things quite similar to this, I would imagine, um, perhaps without the ability to OCR, you know, <laughs> any uh, text of a given user's choice, um, but certainly that kind of educational model. And also, I mean, I think it, it, it sort of, um, it does kind of gesture at this kind of knowledge economy function, right? Whereas, uh, you know, if the knowledge navigator is specifically designed for people who are high functioning um, knowledge workers, that this is designed to basically bring everybody up to some base level of literacy to be able to participate in a kind of knowledge economy, right? That, um, you know, presumably a, a 30 or 40 year old who d has not learned to read uh, is a manual laborer of some kind, but that, that there's an educational push to basically make sure that they have some baseline skill set in a, in a non-manual economy, essentially. Should we go back to now? Yeah, so uh, we kind of saved it for last, and that's because when you click on now, um, what you get is this kind of very <laughs> interesting um, interface for navigating through essentially all of the content on uh, the LaserDisc. Um, so let's see, I think, click. So what this lets you do is pull from all of the different um, the different clips. I think the easiest thing to do is just click on full list here, but you can see that it's kind of broken down into categories. Um, and we can pick from these to, uh, to create our own sort of minor uh, stack, essentially. Um, and so what we can do is we can select one and then we can say see info. And this shows us um, what this element is. Um, and then we can either view it, or if we hit select, it'll put it in, that f in, in the window that I clicked on in the, in the now stack. And we can put two things in there. Um, that interface seems particularly kind of wonky and unintuitive to me. But what this is good for is browsing through all the content that's on the LaserDisc. So if we want to see what this is, 
Um, this is actually linked to a variety. Some of this is linked to Laserdisc content. Some of it is linked to a variety of other stacks that are included on the CD-ROM. So this serves as kind of a demo uh, for some of the other things, other multimedia content that was available at the time that wasn't um, you know, strictly made by I'm Walter the Multimedia Lab. Culture 1.0, a contextual guide to Western civilization. <laughs> So this was essentially a separate hypercard stack, although it's kind of embedded in with everything else. Um, that this is a demo version of which I believe you can buy or could buy a full version of um, that was kind of an educational, yeah, here's purchase information. That link always works. Um, yeah, $175 for uh, presumably a CD, possibly a floppy disk. Um, with with this information on it, but with the stuff here that's kind of whited out um, included, right? So this, you can kind of tour through a subset of what would be on the, the full $175 one to see what, uh, what it would be on. Oh, I think you need to click on one of the bolded words. Yeah, oftentimes when you get into these demos, there's really only like one or two things that actually works. Um, but you know, it would show you how if you wanted to, you know, if you were looking for this presumably for a classroom or something to teach history, you could have, you know, it would show you what it would give you um, in terms of multimedia content related to uh, various moments in history. And then if we exit this, we go back here. You want to uh, select it? Yeah, if we select it. Oh. There we go. It goes in there, and then we can select something else. Select one with video. Yeah, that's I'm trying to find one with video. I think we can, we can restrict the thing to just the video clips yeah. there. Oh, yes. Uh, not a whole lot. Uh, some of it's on the, yeah, so some of, more of it's on the Sorry. B side. Um, pencil test. Want to check? Yeah, the pencil test is actually quite interesting, so we should show that. Um, there's also an in intermedia demo mark oh, that's on, the, um, oh, yeah. on the side. We can show that um, too. Oh, So Pencil Test was a, a computer animation that uh, Apple did to showcase the uh, capacities of the Macintosh 2. Um, so this is a you know, kind of early example of Apple uh, computer animation. Let's take a look at that. And it was, so it was, um, it was done at the Advanced Technology Group, which was Apple's research lab. And an interesting uh, fact is that um, software curator Al Caso, um, who works at the museum with us, was on that team as well. Yeah, and there's a behind the scenes video as well that, uh, that he's in, describing so, how they made a render farm, essentially, to, to do this out of, I forget how many, but many, you know, 20-some Macintosh 2s. Yeah, so ATG was led by Larry Tesler at the time. Well, who started ATG, basically, and who had come to Apple from Xerox Park.
Well, I think kind of an interesting uh, story or allegory of how things move from the digital world to the real world, right, as well. Um, you know, again, kind of designed with the idea of pushing this notion that the Macintosh 2 was at the sort of forefront of um, full color animation and multimedia more generally. Now I'm trying to figure out how to. Um, oh yeah, how do we unselect? <laughs> how to unselect things exactly? Uh, Does the back key work? Well, what if you double click it? I will try that. I don't remember HyperCard mm. being a very double clicky. That's true. Huh. Shift yeah, so click. this is an issue. Shift click <laughs> <Yeah>. or command click. <laughs> no. No. Nope. All right. Oh. Well, here I'm gonna cheat and just I'm sure if I quit and reopen it, it'll work just fine. If we have time, I would like to try um, to try playing the uh, Holy Land. Title. Okay. I think that's really interesting as well. Well, something I wanted to show uh, just really quickly, and we certainly don't need to show all of it, is um, the Mathematica thing. Oh, I yeah. I think it's interesting that... That's a really long one, too. <laughs> yeah, it's super long. We don't have to show the whole thing. What I think is interesting is that it's kind of designed to basically tell people or convince people that like math is easy and math is WYSIWYG and so it's like the same kind of like the drive at this moment is this drive to make everything user friendly and very like kind of you know rich media and uh, it's it's you know it's fully about the interface it's not about what's going on under the hood even to the point where math which is what's going on under the hood at all times is like repurposed as this kind of thing that um, you know, you can sort of get at intuitively through a, a UI, right? Um, I mean, that's certainly true for Apple. Yeah, but I mean, Mathematica, I think, is not just yeah. an Apple product. Yeah, it's right? true, yeah. Like, but Mathematica is explicitly targeting GUI environments. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, it's part of so this the, whole So the Mac, the Next. Right. But what I'm saying is this whole moment is a moment about mm -hmm. making these interfaces to the point where you can even do make that interface onto math itself, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the that's the point of Mathematica. Like and it's interesting that's included on 
this collection as because this whole collection is kind of about the same thing it's like oh you can make your own videos you can make your own everything you don't need to necessarily know how to code that much in order to do it right like it's about that kind of user friendliness is this really taking a while it did take a while okay there we go although actually Seems like when I click on it, it I think maybe you need to click. Oh on. no, no, no! Well, okay. There's got to be a way to there absolutely unselect to be a way. it. What if you command click? No. No. Option click. Oh. Well, this is just see now what it does oh, is you're it's just, linking you're just, to those cards. You're that just are associated you're just with cycling each thing. through the cards. Well, that's because I started using the, the uh, arrow, keys. arrow keys. Yeah. Well. So I don't know how to clear these, which is again what shows you, you the kind of wonkiness of the UI. What right? if you held it down? No. <laughs> I don't think that hypercard really has these kind I mean I'm sure there's probably a way to code it in but you know but I don't how think would it's you like once you've selected it there's no way to unselect it is that we can see yeah look at the script if option key is down oh okay oh. try option <laughs> yeah. option click modifier thing we didn't try one thing we didn't try there we yeah, go. There we go. All right. <laughs> okay. Of course. Intuitive. <laughs> easy to use. <laughs> okay. So yeah, now that now that we know how to clear those out, um, we can go back in and pick other things. So this is, like I said, I've, this interface I find you know pretty wonky. But if you get past that, what it lets you do is browse through everything on both the CD and the laser disc, um, and then you know you can you can find it all, which is nice. Um, so yeah, let's look at some of the stuff on the second side. Um, Mathematica. Like Mathematica. Well, we already looked at pencil tests, so yeah. Intermediate interests me, but I'm not sure this is the right time or place. Well, we can, well let's watch it. We can yeah. watch it. I don't know how long it is. But let's view it. <laughs> so again, this is a sort of um, tour through the Brown University uh, Iris Intermedia Project. This is a demonstration of the Intermedia system from Iris at Brown University. Intermedia is a prototype of the desktop of the future, including hypermedia linkage and integrated linguistic tools. What I'm doing now is opening up some folders that have documents in them. The special icon over here is the icon for a web. A web is a set of links that connect a set of documents that live on our desktop. When I open up this icon, which in this case is called Apollo Missions, I'll get a web that links together documents concerning the flights to the moon that happened in the late 60s, early 70s. What opens up here is a combination history view of all the documents that I visited in my last session, and when we open up some existing documents, we'll see that it shows us the current document and all the links that emanate from that document. I'll start by opening up this moon site document. This is a graphics document. Um, very similar to a Mac draw like document. These markers that surround the different text words are what we call anchors. And from these anchors, we from these anchor markers, we can go and follow links. If I click that marker, select it, and issue the follow command, I can navigate to another document. In this case, from this anchor, we have two links, one that goes to a mission summary and one that goes to a photo of the Hadley real orbit. We'll take the uh, link to the mission summary, and that will bring up a document in our InterWord application. InterWord is an application very much like Microsoft Word. It has full hierarchical style sheets. And what we see here is that we've highlighted a, the destination of that link. So we're anchored to a summary of Apollo 15 here, and we, the other anchor at the other end is this Apollo 15 site right here. The whole notion of intermedia is not just that I can browse links very easily, but that I can create links as easily as I could um, 
follow them. So we modeled that after copy and paste, and I can go over here and talk about obtaining a deep core sample. Simply select that and issue the command start link. Then I can go and find another document in our folder system. As we normally do, just like when we do a copy and paste, open up that folder and find another site. And I will uh, scroll a little bit more. And I want to go and talk about the Station 9 real edge. So I go over there, that opens up another Word document. And I'll find some conversation here. And I can link to anything of any granularity from a single insertion point to a whole paragraph or a whole document. I'll simply issue the complete link command, just like I would normally do paste. And we get a link marker there. And when I follow that link marker, it brings us right back to where we were. Now, another thing that we have added to Intermediate is the ability to go and integrate full linguistic tools. So if you are interested in going and understanding what different words might be that you don't understand, we have the Full American Heritage Dictionary online. So if I don't know what uh, a magnetometer is, I simply touch that and say, define. This is the first time we've used the dictionary, so it brings up a little dialog box, but it goes and finds um, that word. Now, I can simply touch on that word and hit Control D or Apple D, and it'll go and find out what magnet magnetic is. We're really trying to go and create synergistic tools, not have the not have application islands where every application works by itself and not have islands of individuals where they're all working by themselves, but to have networked people, networked information, so everybody's sharing the same set of information and have applications working together. Um, that's what we set out to do. So yeah, it's an example of uh, the intermediate system that we also you know, demoed on the, on on the Macintosh version as well. Um, you know, it's interesting to me how much uh, of this kind of conception is based around navigating and creating links between multiple windows. Like, it's very graphical even when it's dealing with um, textual information. Kind mm -hmm. of very different, I think, than how we do web design, where you, I mean, the, the link is implicit between if you have, you know, a text editor open and you're editing an HTML page and you have a web browser open that you're loading the same page and reloading as you change it. That link is, you know, those are two separate applications. Those are two separate programs that just happen to be running on your computer. And that link is implicit in your head, in a sense. Whereas in, in these kind of systems, the link is very explicit in different windows and different mm -hmm. um, kind of things. Of course, as I was saying, the early World Wide Web browser kind of was similar to, more similar to these early, the Iris Intermedia systems and things like that, where you could edit inside uh, a one window in the, in the web browser. Well, and the, this is fairly <coughs> unique, though, because this also was trying to replace your file system right, in some ways. Right. Yeah, he says it's a, desk, a desktop of the right. future, so it's it's like the Finder, essentially. Right, and so, yeah. It's integrating all of your applications together in one big web. In some ways, it's like the Java vision of later on that didn't happen. Mm -hmm. You mean like the network computer kind of? Yeah, well, the idea that you would have, you know, you would bring multimedia into one environment rather than, you know, going out to separate applications mm -hmm. for each type of media. Um, and then, yeah, the other thing I wanted to show on this was the uh, demonstration yeah. for um, Mathematica, which uh, still exists with the same Wolfram Mathematica. Um, here, an early version, and quite a long clip. We don't need to watch it all, but uh, quite a long discussion of kind of how you can use this tool on the Mac specifically for uh, mathematical research. Uh, and what I find interesting about this is the way that it sort of reformulates math itself as an object of the graphical user interface or as an object of this kind of multimedia technology. Uh, so you have an interesting situation where obviously on some lower level, mathematics is what's driving all of this. It's what's driving the code that we're using to uh, navigate through these things. It's what's driving the code that we use to just communicate with the Laserdisc player and so on and so forth. Um, yet it's also kind of reformulated in this moment, as most things are, 
as the object of a kind of set of user-friendly tools and interfaces that you can just sit down and play with. And so I find it interesting that mathematics is both the kind of the source and the object um, of this kind of multimedia moment. Alfred North Whitehead, the English philosopher and mathematician, once said that civilization advances by extending the number of important operations which we can perform without thinking of them. I just simply typed plot 3D sine xy and I got this three-dimensional image. That was great. I used to spend years trying to get these kinds of images. It was really exciting. To be able to generate 43 or 100 or 200 uh, places of uh, Euler's gamma constant or any other thing you wanted, it's absolutely extraordinary. Mathematica frees people from the tyranny of manual calculation, and that's important because it allows science to be more inspirational. Within months of its release, Mathematica began to transform the world of mathematical research and instruction. In the next few minutes, we'll hear from some of the people who pioneered the use of Mathematica on the Macintosh and meet its creator, Stephen Wolfram. When I started off doing mathematics, I wasn't very good at it. I never learned my multiplication tables, and it was certainly the conclusion of my teachers at that time that there was no way I would ever go on and do anything of any kind of quantitative nature or anything um, uh, sort of mathematically oriented. As it turned out, I found out about computers and found out that you could make computers do these kinds of things. We kind of identified several different sorts of mathematics that people like to do. Numerical mathematics, symbolic mathematics, and graphics. The user interface for Mathematica on the Macintosh is a particularly sophisticated one. One of its most important features is the ability to produce what we call Mathematica notebooks, ways of mixing text and graphics together with live Mathematica input. The, the goal of a software designer should be to build a system where people just say, I turn to my Macintosh, I do a calculation, I don't really notice that this is done with Mathematica and that it has a particular syntax, a particular semantics, and so on. The thing that's great about Mathematica on the Macintosh is the way that the user interface is built for that particular system. Um, the Macintosh has a very rich user interface environment. What we've done is to build a very kind of graphically oriented user interface that allows people to do things like build up interactive textbooks um, that make use of nice fonts and uh, uh, nice kinds of graphical ideas on Macintosh. And that's something that the kind of Macintosh environment and Macintosh culture has uniquely allowed us to do. So what I think that's a good place to stop it. Um, but, but what I think specifically really interests me about that um, is that it starts off with this quote from the philosopher Alfred North Whitehead, right? And um, Whitehead is one of a number of figures who have been kind of marshaled to think through um, the, the, the kind of qualitative turn that network technologies and digital technologies more broadly have brought. And that quote kind of suggests this notion that uh, the graphical user interface and these other technologies have succeeded in making a jump such that uh, we no longer have to think about what goes on behind the scenes, right? Um, I think in many ways, especially today, we know that's not true. I mean, a lot of scholars have kind of interrogated the notion of the graphical user interface as a kind of um, ideology of a sense, a sense that because, precisely because it lets you uh, forget about what's happening under the hood, so to speak. Um, but you can see really in this moment that that notion is, is in full flower and that precisely the idea is, is that we can automate away all of these things. We have 
we don't have to worry about our multiplication tables because we have Mathematica and so on and so forth. Um, and I think that very much speaks to the whole moment of multimedia. It's this moment when um, we kind of don't have to worry anymore, as users at least, about how these technologies work. We're all just, we can all just kind of uh, become sort of brick allures on the machine and put everything together in new ways to create new material without sort of, you know, actually diving under the hood and understanding how to make new things. Is there anything else uh, you think it's worth looking well, at? Well, we have 10 work? minutes. Yeah. I think maybe we have time to check out the Holy Land one really quick. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. Um, it's, 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 you can get it through it, through here, through the now. Okay. Yeah. Go back to the... So this came with the Encyclopedia of Multimedia, right? The laser disc and everything. So yeah, this is a separate uh, project that is here uh, represented by HyperCard Stack. Uh, it's called In the in Holy the Land. Holy. Yeah. Um, and inside the Encyclopedia of Multimedia box, there's also a separate laser disc for uh, this stack, which is um, which is made in kind of conjunction with um, ABC News to give kind of historical overview of the uh, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, at least up to you know 1989 or so. So you can see how it's broken up into two sides, um, one more historical and perhaps impersonal, and the other side a little more dedicated on the, the issues of the day. Um, we're on side one, aren't we? I think so. Yeah. So this is very interesting. It's probably one of the most uh, fully thought out kind of integrations of the video content and the HyperCard stack. And I think this was actually a whole series that ABC put out of titles that this this one title just happened to be included in with this encyclopedia of multimedia. Hmm. But ABC had a whole list of additional titles, like the Martin Luther King one is one of them. Hmm. Like there's a demo of that one here, but is it not working? Maybe I need to play this. Yeah, you do. I think this is right. We just huh. It worked before. Don't just still need to click. Oh on. wait, we need to set the video. Um. Yeah, forty-eight hundred. There we go. What? Uh, try to click it again. Select select the forty two hundred. Forty two? No no no. Select the forty the model number. Okay. Uh, check. Click check. Click the check button. Is it on the modem port, and not the printer? It's port? on the modem port. Yeah. Let's just say OK and see if it works. I feel like I had that problem before. Okay. 
click on one of the choices below. No, I, yeah, that I, should I give us something. I don't yeah. think it worked. I yeah, think I don't think it works either. Uh, it, it was working. <sighs> Let me. Uh, we can just open up the Holy Land stack and maybe yeah. that'll. Um, um, where is it though? That's on the CD-ROM itself. Let's oh, see. this is yeah. Although I don't know if. Yeah, maybe I didn't copy it to the hard disk. Yeah, let, let's. This worked. This worked before. We definitely had this working. Maybe, oh, ma try try running the uh, different version of HyperCard. Try running 1.2.2. It's not going to work. Yeah. Um, quit hypercard and launch launch uh, yeah that one I don't really remember having to do much of anything before. See, that works. I mean, it might complain that it's not the right thing, but it works. Yeah, that's all you got. You got to click it again. Yeah, you just need to click Weird. it. It's Okay, try 2200. No, tw try the 20, l the, yeah, the one at the top. Hmm. That is very odd. Yeah, we had this on 8000 before, I remember. So there we go. Oh. Now it's just very persnickety. Yeah. yeah. Hello, I'm Ted Koppel. This is side one of an interactive video disc examining the turmoil in the Holy Land. On this side of the disc, you'll be able to see and review many of the religious, geographic, historic, and political images and events which have been so much a part of the Holy Land for the past 4,000 years. What you see, and in what order you see it, is entirely up to you. Where is this land, and what does it look like? Who are the people who want to live there? 
Why have their religious beliefs been so important to the land? How has history invoked such hostility over the land? In short, what has brought the Holy Land and its people into conflict today, and why is that conflict important to us? This side of the video disc will help you answer those questions, and I will be here to guide you, and as you select highlights to watch, a Spanish translation will be available as an option on the second audio channel. Study and learn from this history of hatred in the Holy Land. So one thing I think that's particularly interesting about this is it allows this kind of opportunity for people to um, to experience the same event or perspectives on the same event from uh, from multiple sides, right? So um, you get you can pick an, a date in uh, Holy Land history, and then through clicking through, you can get. Um, a perspective from essentially the Israeli side and a perspective from the, the Palestinian side. Um, either separately, so you can just play one of them. The Israeli army swept to its victories, but of course it swept to those victories on the uh, ground, uh, which created the vacuums. In other words, Arabs fled before the advancing armies in order to make sure that they didn't always return. Many of the villages were razed to the ground. In other words, Israel really had to fashion the state by its own self-defensive force against the attempt to destroy it. It was during this period that the balance of power uh, in favor of the Israelis uh, had its most uh, uh, tremendous effect in causing the exodus of Palestinians from scores of towns and hundreds of villages. This was the beginning of the refugee uh, 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 problem. Uh, or you can play them back to back with this, this larger clip, right? And so this you can do this for um, a large number of events. Um, this is part of the same event, but here's another event. Um, and so you get to see kind of at least uh, two sides of, of the issue, not necessarily to say that there are only two sides or that these people represent uh, the side that they're on completely, but that the whole idea is, is that you can uh, juxtapose different uh, positions on the same kind of development through this kind of interface, essentially. That could be useful for some of the people we do oral histories with here. Yeah, I mean, you, you could see, I mean, you know, I guess this would be equivalent to embedding two YouTube videos into the, you know, into the same page or something. Um, but I think that, you know, if it's this time especially, it's novel, and perhaps in a way it might be novel now as we become a more polarized uh, society. It's a resource of images and sounds. This is water contract. Use your Macintosh computer to see things from other points of view. At different times, in different places, in a new light. Then create your own presentations and bring the world into your classroom.